All right, everybody, we're moving right into our next talk with Christy Lee Manahan from Core Scientific. She's going to be speaking with us about mining things, which is an arrow hat, so it's about, uh, it is of interest to uh, some of us here. Please, by all means, come in and take a seat. We ask that if you're hanging out in the back, please keep the volume down as a courtesy to those who are trying to listen to the talk, and it's greatly appreciated. Uh, any conversations that are in depth, please take them outside. That's once again very appreciated uh, to as a courtesy to the people that are listening to the talk. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to you. Go ahead. Testing, testing, there we go. Ah, oh, man. Well, hello from the Narrow Village. Have you been having a good death call? Good to hear. I have, this year I've learned how to have to track a flight, a desktop phone, an airplane, and a voting machine. You know, valuing skills that will serve me well, but don't worry, don't worry, Dave, I just want your hashes. Speaking of hashes, today I want to talk to you about accessible mining. What is it? Why do you Why on earth does it impact the network? Well, accessible mining is a simple notion. It's the concept that any human being around the world can jump in and start contributing to the cryptocurrency network with no request required. See, this is really critical when you start a bootstrap network, or especially when the mining is in the lower, uh, um, in the top 10 currencies and it's trying to gain large scale adoption and large scale decentralization. That low barrier really is critical to mass adoption. The video game industry figured this out quite quickly. That's why a game like Fortnite can have 250 million players versus the 500 players in a game like World of Warcraft. When you, as a human, have very little risk to try something new, you, you're more open to engage. It's instinct, and building a great product is about taking advantage of human instinct. In fact, that's one of the reasons I'm so good chain technology in general. It's one of the only industries in the world right now where psychology, economics, infrastructure, hardware, software, and security are so tightly apart. In other industries, you can remove one of those pillars and you can still have a functioning product. In blockchain, if you remove a single part, it crumbles. About it. So today, some of the things I want to cover are engagement uh, mechanics. Um, how do we how do we engage with cryptocurrency? How do we generate more users through the use of proof of work mining? How does that directly contribute to the decentralization and the narrow state of vision goal? A little bit about energy consumption, because this is one of the things that we're going to run into a lot as developers when we're talking to outside participants as well as outside companies, specifically when you tie yourself to a proof of work algorithm. Regardless of whether it's CPU based, GPU based, or AC based. And also, where it next? Is it a solution? Does it meet the stated goals of AC existence? A consensus algorithm is key to user engagement. User engagement is how you build a great product and subsequently a great cryptocurrency. While many argue that proof of stake is the future for cryptocurrency scalability, they forget the biggest trade off. Proof of stake only works in countries where procuring different cryptocurrency is seamless and in networks that have a very mature ecosystem and a very mature user base. Think about a brand new user who has an understanding of cryptocurrency. How likely are they to purchase coins with their hard earned fiat and start staking? Highly likely. The generation mechanics for a coin need to be carefully decided. Remember when we talked about how hardware is uh oh, there we go. See, the hardware you target is critical to user engagement. Many like to argue that dedicated mining hardware increases network security due to skin in the game or other nonsensical statements, but they forget that this only works if the dedicated hardware has widespread adoption, healthy supply chains, and a minimal barrier to entry. An ASIC eliminates the acquisition of users who may have been capping miners with spare GPUs or CPUs, or participants who want to get engaged with minimal investment. But rather than just talking, let me show you. So this slide comes from the Fidelity Mining Summit. It's produced by Nick Cutter, a partner at Castle Island Networks. See, Nick found that there is a strict correlation between when ASICs get the network publicly, or rather when the uh, uh, ASICs 
establishing it. And when the growth of users and confidence in the network slowed down, we can see the correlation of uh, active role in the crisis. And AC manufacturing is going to fiercely deny this whenever you lost them. They're going to talk about how valuable their hardware is, how it aligns incentives, how it creates decentralization. But the reality is that when someone rebuilds hardware for the same purpose, they will do whatever it takes to ensure that how hardware is livelihood is not jeopardized. This creates the wrong incentives for the network participant. It creates the wrong incentives for a privacy point. Contrast this with the incentives of solid and non consumer grade hardware. Their day to day usage of this hardware is most commonly reserved for other use cases. This can be anything from CGI rendering for some of the larger scale TV operators to video games and streaming through the home user. Now, for the CPUs, most likely, a CPU is going to be tied to the GPU regardless, but you're only limited to one if you're a home user or have an average device, or two if you're a server operator, or four if you're just a super badass. Now, I'm always asked all the time by uh, investors or also some of my colleagues, but Chrissy, Chrissy, what about those big, ser scary server farms that Amazon and Microsoft have? What if they come in and take control of the cryptocurrency network? Here's the thing. If there's money to be made in any way, shape, or form, you are going to incentivize participation. This happens on proof of work, happens on proof of faith, proof of authority, every single consensus algorithm. And that's okay. All you want to do is ensure that you have set yourself up for success and you point out for success to get as much user adoption by our own needs. A participant like Amazon or Microsoft is also only going to use relevant cycles and be what we call an automatic reminder. Um, and I was actually surprised how many people didn't realize there are two types of miners or how, how little mining there is spread around uh, the ecosystem today. So the math miners are the kinds of miners that run from home to home network, seeking profit. They're not going to engage in the community, they'll not be on this call, they'll not come in to look at how they're investing the mine. They will sit in a silo and generally switch to whatever is the most profitable. Now, sometimes a nomadic miner will fall in love with the community of product provision and transition into what we call a tribalistic miner. By contrast, tribalistic miners stay locked into a network, regardless of the price. These people are big community contributors when it comes to security, optimizations, applications, and spreading awareness. Even during the bear market, there were a subset of miners that stayed locked into both the Monero network the Ethereum network, and even the Litecoin network. Even today with the Litecoin hobby, there is still double the net hash compared to what was at the start of the year. It is a coin network's responsibility to do whatever it takes to capture as many tribalistic miners as possible. Much like the VCs of the traditional era, a tribalistic miner has to be sold on some part of your strategy, whether it's the vision, the team, the product, the community, or the code. Now, a majority of miners, uh, a majority of coins win their user, ba user base by converting these nomadic miners to tribalistic miners. The only way to do this without massive marketing budgets is that they will own the coin because they believe in the future of strategy, or simply when they move. But those filthy miners contribute to the heat death of the universe. Now, surprisingly, I also deal with this statement a lot. Uh, pretty much every second day, whether it comes from new interns, new participants, clients, and well, generally this is how I answer it. Yes, there are 7.67 gigawatts of energy currently consumed by the Bitcoin network right now. To which you should probably point out that the banking system right now consumes three times this. Now, if you're going to try and build a global financial ecosystem, yes, power consumption is probably going to be involved. Actually, if you're going to do a kind of computing system, power is going to be involved. But zoom out on the big picture. See, we've got to put it into, into comparison. Bitcoin right now represents 0.25% of total electricity production in the world. It consumes less than 0.29% of total electricity in the world. Now, right now, the amount of electricity um, that you could produce uh, for the Bitcoin network would power it 66 times with hydro, 9 times with biofuels and waste, 22 times with solar and wind gas. See, cryptocurrency mining is the only activity right now in the world that can turn wasted energy into cash. Funny thing about biofuels, 
dreams, fighting without ass, and soul or wind. Harnessing that energy and storing it is actually incredibly expensive and a bit of a special specialty. And that stability of this energy also isn't suitable for any sort of HPC work, AI work, whatever you can think. If you run out of juice halfway through training in the mall, well, you're, well, you're fucked. That creates incredibly powerful incentive, incentives with participants in the ecosystem right now if you think about this on a bigger scale. Take the coin out of the picture. So, when I joined the course scientific, I started thinking seriously about this problem. There was idle energy all around the world, new coins could get half power or have trouble getting these tribalistic miners, and centralized mining was kind of wreaking havoc in the industry. See, there's nothing I can do to help the Bitcoin network simply because of how the SHA-2560 algorithm is designed. Any sort of consumer device will not catch up to this, this dedicated market. So, two things happened uh, during, during this thought session. One was that I happened to stumble upon a report from the NRDC, the Natural Resources and Defense Council. They did a study on home iron load in America. Basically, how many, how many devices were wasting energy and they found that always on but inactive devices are costing Americans $19 billion annually. So these are devices like a TV that are consuming energy all, all around the world, but while they're inactive. See, doing a uh, load around and burn down um, mechanics on devices is actually incredibly complex. A lot of the manufacturers still skip in the industry, and it's just not advanced there right now. So there's always power leakage. This is, this is a fact of the embedded hardware ecosystem. So these were things like fish bombs, they found, consumed a ton of energy, hot, uh, uh, hot water uh, reduction pumps, set top boxes, fans. So I found this away in my brain and I thought, wouldn't it be cool to mine? with an aquarium or a television. And then my boss told me to go to this real work. And I largely forgot about it until Project Lab began. For those, for those of you who heard my talk at uh, um, Project Lab was a uh, initiative we launched a company called Astral AR, uh, making drones that stop bullets be able to uh, like current so that they can get back to their objects um, while they're while they're these drones spent about 22 hour uh, life cycle per day, just hot. Now, Project Flatman couldn't have worked without a targeted mining algorithm like Remax that was dedicated to the goals of this one to one user distribution. The economics wouldn't have worked, they would never have gotten funded, the hardware would never have been rolled out. All of a sudden, through this one simple act of choosing the right mining algorithm, we managed to convert a whole new generation of people to start thinking about cryptocurrency and expose them to the narrow of all coins. And of course, my personal, uh, my personal enjoyment is the fact that, hey, it's also government hardware. See, that's the important thing to understand. Your algorithm is just one piece of the decentralization puzzle. It's also about how, long, how many users can get adopted and locked into your network. How many of these users can you convert into tribalistic miners? Enter RandomX. So RandomX had a vision. CPUs, one-to-one, -one, uh, as close to Satoshi Nakamoto's vision as possible. There's a little bit of a problem with that. RandomX is targeted towards devices that consume uh, 4 gigabytes uh, worth of memory. Now, this might be great for a home desktop, but the reality is that most home desktops aren't going to practically be engaged in mining. Most of the participants in the micro mining ecosystem now do not have a home desktop, they don't have a cell phone or some sort of handheld device, they have a gaming device. Not all of these kinds of, not all of this equipment actually has um, sufficient memory. For Project Gladium, we're okay. The other drone can have up to 6 16 gigabytes of DDR3 on board, thank you, it's inter thanks to its internal architecture. So we personally don't have any pro uh, problems with that project. But I started to realize that as we started to talk to more participants in Core Scientific and hyper started to spread, we wanted to start rolling this out to other devices. 
We've engaged with a large number of uh, companies, some of which I wish I could talk about today, but I'll have to wait for a few weeks, that all are starting to see the benefits of proof of work mining. See, Rendex is very required again. The Ren uh, average memory available for an embedded device is going to be 256 megabytes, just. Now, while the CPU target is great and perfect, the memory requirement only benefits the hardware and the memory requirements, such as cameras. Surprisingly, what I found, a majority of the facial recognition cameras in places such as China, some of the Asian continents, um, also Germany, this is the perfect target for random X. And then I start thinking, hmm, is that really the user participants you want on your network? Because that's what they're going to attract. See, that's the clever thing about design consensus mechanisms. This subtle change tweaks the user base that you're going to attract. Now, the future of mining belongs to mass consumer hardware. I know this to be true. I've lived through this space for 10 years. I've watched, I've watched us go from CPUs to GPUs to ASICs, and I'm starting to see that there is this trend and this surge of uh, mass consumer hardware coming back. It's going to come in the form of embedded devices. Why? Again, it is those um, incentives, it's that, that engagement mechanic. Let's just go through a little exercise for a moment. Imagine collecting the data from the fridge, tokenizing it, and storing it on the uh, Monero blockchain while it's mining. So Amazon's going to pay you for that data, just a tiny amount, on time access. Why would they do that? Well, imagine the light bulb in your fridge goes up, and I just learned that all of the American fridges have light bulbs. You know, maybe this thought experiment doesn't work for you, the keyword. Now, all of a sudden, Amazon, who has paid you for an active subscription to the machine to learn trick from your fridge, sends you an alert. They have got the first chance to send you a uh, advertisement. They say, hey, the light bulb is out. Here's a special deal for light bulbs right now. Oh, I don't even have sense. Take it a step further. Imagine you have a subscription service where the moment uh, your machine reports a failure and it goes up to the chain, replacement parts are issued. See, your blockchain tells Amazon the light bulb is out. Amazon orders and sends you that light bulb automatically and then starts using your fridge's mining revenue to pay back for the cost of the light bulb. You get a notification in your phone to replace the light bulb. Take it a final step further. Imagine you want to buy a fridge. You can see a historical report on the narrow chain of how many light bulb replacements this fridge has needed over the years of operation, how many times it's needed service, how often it has overheated, all of this data reported becoming the car facts of the mining ecosystem. See, these things are already in active, um, actively being uh, built behind the scenes. That small tweak to your proof of work algorithm has changed the kinds of users that you're starting to engage now. And again, that ability to monetize your own hardware cycles is a powerful, powerful step forward right now. See, I'm quite bullish on Monero right now. I believe by the end of the year, Monero is going to have at least uh, 2x the user adoption of Ethereum, simply because of the amount of devices that are going to be locked into the ecosystem. These devices will not change well. these devices will be dedicated, contributing steady cash power. And what's going to end up happening is a flywheel. This always happens with mining networks. We've seen it a little bit with uh, Bitcoin, where you can correlate the net hash drops to actually the price. See, when you have steady hash rate and steady user engagement, your price and steady uh, sell and buy orders, your market price stays consistent. This attracts a lot, lot more investment, a lot more, uh, I guess, uh, confidence in the network, so on and so forth. And here's the really cool part of this. People that suddenly didn't understand what the hell Monero is start looking for ways where they can actually spend it, ways where they can start using that currency. They don't need to understand what the currency vision is. All they need to know is how do I turn this digital asset into an actual piece of data, or sorry, an actual, actual uh, piece of item. And so I would urge the community to start thinking a little bit about making some tweaks to random apps. That's the whole uh, that's the target of four gigabytes is going to end up incentivizing the wrong kind of participants, at least I believe. Um, but hey, who knows? I could also be wrong. So if you have any questions about uh, random X, or if you have any questions about 
um, an error in general about a proof of work uh, algorithm or about what course scientific is working on. Uh, feel free to ask me. Thank you very much. We actually have uh, five minutes for questions if anyone does have any questions. So with Project Lime, uh, there was a research paper done together with the Narrow Research Labs um, over an algorithm to um, enforce peer-to-peer. There's also been some research specifically with the Narrow about uh, reforming how things work. My answer is simply we would engage the Narrow community to figure out how we actually uh, make sure that we do not swarm a pool and incentivize the fashion. Um, that is something that I would have to spend a lot of time thinking and researching. Um, when we've talked to manufacturers, most of them are okay. They, they don't really care where the device is aligning to, as long as it's consistent revenue in some shape or form, um, and as long as, as long as they can ensure that they have mobility the or they can track, hey, if I sent three shares to the pool, did I get paid, paid for three shares? So the, the, my answer is, I would hope it would be more pure peer based. Otherwise, the other way is just going to go back to Bitcoin and decentralization. The other way we could play this is by having an algorithm which distributes a percentage of the hash rate um, to different pools. So say you have 100 mining fridges, you allocate 25 to pool X, 25 to pool Y, and so on and so forth. That's also another way to play it. You and I. So pretty much anything that has some sort of uh, graphical screen, like some of the smart figures or smart TVs, you'd be surprised about the amount of memory they're carrying in today. Um, so most most of the top of the line Samsung smart TVs actually have four gigabytes, same with bridges. Now that also locks out a lot of our consumers. I talked about incentive and uh, mechanics before. Here's what I envision, and I've seen it play out a few times. If all of a sudden a company like Samsung gets a great deal where they can suddenly take ten dollars off all of their hardware and have it paid back, or they can give ten dollars um, in loyalty points to the consumer, that is a lot they have over their competitors at Sony. Then Sony is going to be incentivized to go and purchase the memory and operate their new uh, TV to four gigabytes, take advantage of this. We saw this at, um, actually happen in 2017 with the uh, great uh, mining, mining crypto rush when it came to memory prices. So, uh, which was which was crazy, and I, I lived through that, and I lived through a lot of the projects as well. And that that told me a lot about how manufacturers um, get directly tied to proof of work incentives, even though none of them hold it. So that's what I imagine is going to happen there. Now, for the home user, it is going to get easier. See, there are currently um, FPGAs and ASICs on the existing Monero network. Um, I keep a close eye on what, what is happening in the hardware ecosystem. A few of the participants here also know of my involvement in the original Monero ASICs. So, um, this is going to, Random X is going to knock off ASICs entirely. I am pleasantly surprised, aside from the fact that um, Monero has one, one sort of vulnerability where you can uh, upload a portion of the ASIC and bypass the JIT. Other than that, Monero is actually pretty cool. Bulletproof. Meaning, I could do an FPGA that's streaming for it right now, and it would be only about 1.3x uh, um, more performant. On a GPU, you're going to get uh, about the same performance right now with some uh, optimization tricks in the newest gen, so it's going to be fairly, fairly uh, egalitarian. So, very exciting. Mm-hmm. 
Exactly. So here's here's the interesting part of that. For a bigger company based in the US, they're going to be required to be entirely hands off, meaning they're going to have to give the uh, user the option to opt in to this service, and then it's entirely left in the hands of the user, meaning that they control the wallet, they control the private keys. Now, when it's a company outside of the US, most of them are going to be more incentivized to actually directly control the money, directly control the rewards. Unfortunately, I don't know of a good way to stop that, um, aside from not doing it. And when you are working with a uh, larger company, you naturally are incentivized to do whatever makes the company money. So it is, it is a way out. Now, the way to flip this around is to directly tie it to um, loyalty points or reward points, where the mining rewards are abstracted. In a country like in India, where mining is uh, actually illegal right now, and cryptocurrency is a bit sketchy, um, having the ability to directly convert the mining in there into fiat um, without any, and passing that on to the, to the owner of the hardware. Or to the um, or in the form of loyalty points or reward points if you're on a gaming system, etc., might be the appropriate way to go about that. Anyone else? Yep. Yeah. Um, the dev groups have looked at in the blockchain ecosystem as the whole, you don't pay attention to us, and that's okay. All I can do is put out the messages. Um, I can't exactly call, uh, comment on, of course, scientific's vision is for the blockchain space here, um, but we do intend to keep providing infrastructure and platform services. Um, and one of the things that's very interesting to realize now is that most of the ASIC manufacturers have started to change their tune in a lot of the developments they are doing now. So ASIC manufacturers right now are spending significant resources in investing in both FPGA and GPU technology. We've seen this with uh, the ASICs from InnoSilicon, which are essentially just uh, GPUs. We're seeing this with the thing and their uh, FPGAs they're currently building. And we're starting to see this with uh, Dynamo and all of the other Chinese manufacturers in the resurgence of FPGA technology. So their incentives are going to be closely tied to brand next, and that's something that we need to watch out for because uh, as we have more participants um, in the network and more hardware engineers, more tricks are going to be uncovered.